It's not whiskey, it's uh, tea. <laughs> I wish. Oh, I'm glad it's not whiskey. That, that'd be quite a lot of whiskey for a little bit of half. Hi. Although the interview turned out great, I want to apologize to both Kyle and you for the issues with my microphone. I tried my best to fix them. Enjoy watching. So, hello everyone. I feel so lucky to have Kyle Banks with me today. Passionate about storytelling and emotional power of games, not so many indie developers manage to capture the hearts of players as effectively as you have. Your debut project, Farewell North, takes players on an unforgettable journey through a world drain of color where exploration becomes a metaphor for healing and rediscovery. I can confidently say that this project resonated with me deeply. I felt that connection while playing the demo and I can't wait to buy the full game. Very thrilled to have you, Kyle, here with yeah, me. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Really kind words. It's really kind of you to say. Now, can you tell us about your journey into game development? What inspired you to take the first step into this creative field? So I went to school for um, software engineering. So I'm a software engineer by trade. I worked uh, full time as a software engineer for about 12 years. Um, but pretty much as soon as I like my first day of school, learning to write like my first line of code like a hello world in java i went home and i was like messing around playing making games on like the command line just little like tic-tac-toe and stuff like that um and yeah i feel like learning to code really kind of like, like opened my eyes to what's possible yeah like i said for for about 12 years i worked as a software engineer full time but throughout the entire period i, I was always kind of like dabbling in games like as a side hobby but never anything like too promising. It took a while to kind of like build up all the skills and everything to like make a game that I felt like I could be like proud of and like really like go all in on. Um, and so that ended up being Feral North. But even when I started Feral North, I didn't think that it was going to be like a full game. Like I kept saying to myself, like I'm going to release my, I'm going to release my first game and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't, I don't think like deep down, I actually like believed that. I, I figured it was probably going to be another project that ended up on like the, the kind of graveyard of, of game dev projects that I have kind of over that last 12 years. But something about it really clicked and it, it, it just like felt good and I feel like I had kind of like been at it long enough that I had like the skills to actually like you know make a full game that I could be proud of like I said. And I started sharing clips on like Twitter and stuff and it seemed like it really kind of connected with people. So for three years I was still working full time while working on the game on the side and around uh, the end of year three I was like you know I'm never going to finish this if I don't kind of go all in. I was kind of at a position at work where it was like time time for something new anyways and I was kind of thinking like I couldn't really see myself like I was so tired from working on the game like every morning and every night uh, I couldn't see myself like really starting a job and like going uh, going all in on that and like putting my best before it so I was like you know what I'm gonna take a year off I'm gonna finish this game uh, and I'm gonna put everything I have into it and just see like what happens so um, yeah so that was the last year um, working full-time on Farewell North finishing it up uh, which is really stressful and a lot of fun and really terrifying at the same time. Yeah. But yeah, that's my kind of long-winded answer of uh, yeah how I got to this point of, of making games. Yeah, very interesting journey. I'm curious, were there any specific games or developers that influenced your decision to pursue game development? Yeah, I mean, quite a few. Like, I think uh, the decision to go full-time, that was actually more of just a conversation with my wife. It was kind of more her hyping me up rather than like me asking for permission or anything like that. Like, I was like... I'd been talking about it for so long and I was kind of scared to do it. I, could, I don't think I would have actually pulled the trigger and gone for it if it wasn't for her. But she was actually the one who kind of like pushed me and, and kind of gave me the confidence to be like, you know what, this game's got an audience that people seem to be connecting with. It has potential and, uh, you know, worst come to worst, I'm just get a job again. Like, it's not that not that big a deal. But in terms of other game developers, you know, like there's a, there's a great community on Twitter and stuff, um, but I don't think I ever really spoke to anyone about going full time. I think that was kind of like just a personal decision, like, I knew it wasn't a smart like financial decision or anything like that. Like it was in all likelihood going to be a mistake in, in, in that perspective. So I think I was kind of like embarrassed, but it didn't know if I wanted to like put that out there if I wasn't gonna actually do it. So it was kind of just like, I, I just kind of made the decision with, with my wife and I and just went for it. I really respect that. It takes a lot of courage to do it. It's gonna pay off. Yeah, the game is great. Yeah, really great. Now talking again about the game, what was the initial concept behind Farewell North? How did it evolve over time? Or it suddenly it was like, oh, I already know what I want to do and I'm gonna start doing it. No, not at all. It was not a fully planned out game at all. Um, it started as something completely different. It started as like a weekend project called Comfy Boy and it was just a little silly game about my chihuahua trying to find the comfiest seat in the house. It had absolutely nothing to do with anything to do with what it actually ended up being. Um, but yeah, it kind of just evolved. Like it started, like I said, it's just a silly little game. And then I always, like my brain always just goes to like more emotional storytelling. Um, so anytime I try to make something that's not emotional, it just ends up going that way for some reason. 
So I had that emotional beat and then the Chihuahua didn't fit so we got replaced with a Border Collie and then I was inspired by my move to Scotland and we had gone into lockdown and I was like, well this would be an interesting way to explore Scotland since I can't like physically go around. So then it got set in Scotland and then yeah, everything just kind of like evolved. But it was not planned uh, at all from the beginning. I think it took probably like, I don't know, four or five months for it to look anything like what it eventually became. Yeah, and then it took like probably two years to really kind of like understand what the game actually was. You know what I mean? Um, they went through like a lot of like kind of diversions and different paths and and, and some pretty bad ideas along the way. Uh, and then it, you know, eventually kind of like honed in on what it actually became, but it took a long time and it was not planned. Not planned well at all. Yeah, it's like you have to be very flexible. You know, quit your job and quit your own game. So like, if it doesn't work, then I have to find something else instead. So it's very interesting, though. It sounds like a dream job. Yeah, kind of. But it's also extremely stressful uh, at the same time. So I don't want to glamorize it necessarily, but like when you're, you know, there's some days where you're just kind of like sitting there, spinning your wheels, trying to figure out how to make something work. Not necessarily like technically, but like make it fun or make it interesting or make it thematic or whatever it is that kind of stuff like you can just sit there for days and there's like you can't really f rush that but when it's your job and you have to like come up with a solution because you have deadlines or you're running out of money or whatever it gets pretty stressful um but it is a lot of fun i couldn't imagine anything better honestly since i'm very passionate about psychology mental health and emotional well-being these seem to be subtle themes in farewell north how important is it to you that your game explore deeper personal themes and do you feel games have a therapeutic effect yeah, for sure. I think games have, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, but I think games have a pretty special um, and kind of unique dynamic because it's something that the player can't just be a passive observer. They have to be actively involved in. They have to like go through the motions of whatever the experience is. And so I think games are pretty like uniquely suited for that. And I think we try to lean into that. I can't really talk about that without getting too spoilery, but there's a couple areas of the game where like we very deliberately made sure that the player couldn't just like sit and watch a cutscene. They had to like go through uh, some of the heavier moments just to make sure that they actually experience it and they kind of go through a journey as well. So I think games are pretty uniquely suited for that, which is interesting. And I think for me personally, like I said, my brain always just kind of like goes in that direction. No matter what, you know, when, no matter what it is, I, I was prototyping a few ideas um, since since Fairwell North released. And one of them was a very silly, like, you know, loud, explosive, ridiculous game. But immediately, like an hour into kind of prototyping this, my brain is like, Oh, but then there could be this story and this person could have this and this you know what i mean like i don't know what it is but that's just like what i get the most uh kind of kick out of i would say um so i like uh i like games that can kind of like make you cry or make you feel something so yeah i like playing those and i, I like making those and that's just kind of where my brain goes yeah storytelling is the key also in games that you like and and now my question is how do you approach creating a balance between narrative and gameplay in your projects is there one aspect you prioritize more or do you feel both need to evolve together? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's actually something I'm kind of struggling with right now when I look at like what, what mm -hmm. comes next. I think I prioritize narrative way, way higher than gameplay. Um, I enjoy like playing walking sims. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's not something that like bores me. I think as long as they can tell a really gripping story, I will, I, I'm 100% on board. And so I don't mind uh, like I said, I don't mind my walking sims and I kind of like veer towards that in terms of what I was creating. I think with Feral North, because I was making it kind of in public, like on YouTube and on Twitter and all that, I maybe kind of like went more gamey with it than I would have otherwise, just because a lot of the feedback was like, yeah, but what do I actually do? Or like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like people kind of asking for a bit more. So I, I added more mechanics and stuff. And I think a lot of people still kind of, a lot of the reviews, I would say, put story and audio is like the number one thing. Uh, and gameplay was a little bit lower down the list in terms of like it's not the most you know varied but to me that's that's not a fault like uh, to me like that's that's the kind of games that I like to play I like to play games that tell a story first and foremost um, and if the mechanics kind of get in the way of that I actually find that that to be a negative like I would rather less is more kind of thing but when I look forward to the next game I do want to kind of get better at actual game design and you know making interesting mechanics and fun gameplay so that's something I'm trying to balance is like, can I, you know, take what I've kind of like learned in terms of telling an interesting story and add more kind of gaminess to that without kind of taking away from the story. And I think that that would kind of be like the best of both worlds. Um, but I have a lot to learn there. Like I, I'm definitely more of a, uh, a storyteller rather than like a game designer, I would say. Yeah, I really like your game also because it's about exploring and powering and 
There are not a lot of things like that on the market, or at least I didn't find that. Um, I played the first three, which was great, and right after that, I saw you on a Thomas Bright interview, and I got very, very curious about the game, and then I decided to try the demo. I think that was back in spring, in May or something like that. I also gave some feedback. Yeah. On Steam and uh, I did something and I was like, oh my god, I can't wait to play this game. So I'm still waiting for that day. This university keeps me very busy. <laughs> What's your favorite part of the game development process? Ideation, coding, design, or something else? Definitely coding. Like I'm, a, I'm really am a software engineer at heart, and like I, my my form of procrastination. Like I know if I'm procrastinating, if I start going into like optimization and stuff, because that's just like my favorite thing, and it's super geeky, but like. Shaving a few milliseconds off of something, like some algorithm or whatever it is, uh, is I just get so much satisfaction out of that. Like it's just I, to me that is the most interesting game uh, is optimizing things. So yeah, there's a lot of systems in Feral North that are like way more optimized than they need to be, or way over engineered or whatever. And that's mostly because I was procrastinating on like some other element of uh, the game that I probably should have been working on. So yeah, coding uh, shaders as well. Like I really really love working on shaders. I just find that to be really satisfying. It's like a perfect blend of art and engineering. So that's a lot of fun. Like I think games have a really unique kind of advantage in storytelling mm -hmm. um, and I love finding ways to kind of explore that. And I guess you're using C Sharp or which programming language? Uh, yes, yeah, C Sharp and in, in C Sharp and H of the Cell and Unity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you balance workload versus personal life? Not burn yourself out or slack off? That's also something I'm trying to figure out for the next game. I think the last year uh, I made a lot of mistakes in that regard. Like I really burnt myself out. I got like really depressed for the last few months and that wasn't Kind of fair to my wife i don't think it was very productive it was i was yeah i was not i'm not fun to be around for the last year um so going forward i'm trying to be a little bit more strict about like shutting down my computer and walking away from it at the end of the day um not working more than like eight or nine hours kind of thing in terms of slacking off i don't really have that problem i'm pretty not motivated but pretty like i guess persistent like i i, I will open my computer and just work for eight ten twelve hours straight if i if i don't force myself to stop i am since Spiral North was, has released, I'm trying to like take my time before starting the next project. So I am kind of giving myself more room to like play video games and do stuff that I haven't been able to do for the last few months. And I'm also trying to kind of be a little bit more like thoughtful about what the scope of the next game is so that I don't end up in another situation where I need to like crunch for six months straight. Like the last um, like July and August, right before Feral North released, there was a lot of like literal all nighters with myself and my composer just sitting there working you know, 12 hours straight all through the night. Um, and I was waking up at 4 a.m. and going to bed at, you know, 8 p.m. or whenever I was done for the day and like uh, just working all through every single day, like 16 hour days. So um, yeah, I'm trying to just make sure I don't do that again because it was really unproductive and really just a bad time all around. Just not, not fun, don't recommend it. As an indie developer, what were some of the biggest lessons you've learned while working on Farewell North or any other project? I mean, there's tons of like technical stuff and like, you know, how to do such and such thing in Unity or whatever, like, but I don't think that's the most interesting. Um, I think the, the biggest thing I learned is really just how important scope is. And I'm kind of disappointed because I knew this, because like I said, I was a software engineer by, uh, by trade. I was a technical lead for a long time. So I was managing the scope of, of teams and making sure that we weren't over committing and stuff like that. But then I made all those mistakes that I should have known about in my own personal project. And I think you know, Feral North is not the biggest game in the world, and you might look at it and be like, oh, it's only like five hours long or whatever. Um, and it doesn't seem maybe like from the outside that it is that big of a game, but for a single person, it really is a huge project. I don't think people necessarily always understand like how big even the most basic game is, especially when you start like porting and you deal with all the requirements of Nintendo and Xbox and all this kind of stuff. Like things just get way bigger than they seem on the surface. And so I, I really, really learned like what overscoping means and, and what that kind of like does to your kind of work-life balance and your personal life and everything. So um, yeah, I think that was the biggest lesson and something I'm definitely going to try and carry forward to future projects and making sure that the scope is actually manageable for a single person. You know, I'm at the very beginning of game development, but I feel like it's very interesting and you constantly can learn new stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you never stop learning. Thing. And even when you do feel like you know everything, like at the end of Feral North, I was feeling like very confident that like, you know, I can make anything now, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and as I'm starting this project, I'm already learning all new things and Unity 6 just came out. So there's a whole bunch of stuff to learn there. Like, so you just never stop learning. And I think that's actually a lot of the fun of game development too, right? Is like 
you know, it doesn't, it never gets stale. It's always evolving. It's always growing. It's always new stuff to learn. And I think that's like, to me, the most exciting thing. Yeah. And the people in this field are very interesting. Like I didn't expect to start a kind of a series with interviews, with giving one question. Even though let's say the questions are somehow similar, the answers are never the same. So the experience is very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, I have to say, I was looking at um, the interviews you've done with Freya Freya Holmer and uh, Useless Game Dev, two of my favorite favorite people on Game Dev YouTube. So you've Whoa. definitely got a, a great streak going. Yeah, I hope I don't ruin it. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I'm just sad to say that the microphone doesn't work. I don't know. Hopefully, you guys and all of you can hear me well. I promise the video afterwards is gonna be better. <laughs> and now back to game development. What tools or game engines did you first start with? And how did your approach change as you gain more experience? So when I very first started out, uh, I made the classic mistake of like making my own engine, if you could even call it that. It wasn't an engine, it was just like, you know, basic update loop and stuff like that. And then using like Box 2D for physics and stuff. And then later on, I went to Cocos 2DX, which I don't even know if that's around anymore, but it's like a mobile, like a cross-platform Android and iOS game engine. It's more of a framework, I would say, than an engine, but Anyways, I used SDL for a while, a whole bunch of different things, basically, uh, a bunch of JavaScript frameworks and stuff really early on. And then around like, God, it must have been like 2014, so about 10 years ago, 2014, 2015, yeah, about 10 years ago, um, I switched to Unity, uh, whatever version it was at the time, it was like Unity 5, it wasn't even the 2020 naming scheme yet, it was Unity 5, I think, or maybe even 4, I think it was 5. Anyways, I switched to that and it kind of like stayed on Unity ever since. We're so spoiled now with, with game engines. I made a video about this a long time and I got a lot of crap for it, but like, I really think like if you're if you're choosing between Unity or Unreal, and maybe to a slightly lesser extent Godot, um, but if you're choosing between Unity and Unreal, like, you can't go wrong. These, these tools are incredible and they're the best tools that have ever existed for making games, at least publicly available. You really can't go wrong. I, I think it's really valuable to just kind of like you know spend a few hours playing around with each kind of get a feel for them figure out which one just kind of like suits your workflow mm -hmm. or makes sense to you and then just go all in on that and like learn the tool as much as you can because those engines are deep you have tons and tons and tons of tools built into them uh, and you can spend years i've been using it for 10 years and i still learn new things every single day working in it so um i think it's um i think there's like kind of like depth of experience is more valuable than the choice of engine itself yeah i just use unity because i happened to use unity and unreal wasn't uh free it wasn't even royalty at the time um otherwise i may have picked unreal who knows but i don't really see any reason to change right now and uh yeah so i'm just going full steam ahead with unity at the moment yeah it's a very popular topic nowadays on youtube or it used to be like for years i don't know i'm just new and i saw a lot of reactions like is Unity really better than Unreal or Godot? I feel like you have to try them out, like each, and then see the quantity, and then go for it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Just go go all in on it and and take the years it's gonna like start the years it's gonna take to actually master the tool. Yeah, and that's gonna be way more valuable than whatever like new fancy thing comes out on the other engine. Many aspiring developers face roadblocks when starting their projects. What advice would you give to someone who's just beginning in game development? Just get started. I know this isn't like the the most um, original take, but I think there's a lot of analysis paralysis that goes into like, which engine should I use? Or which language should I use? Which framework or whatever? And at the end of the day, none of those things are as important as just getting going. I, I, that's really the most important thing. It's gonna take a long time to make, to learn, you know, learn all the things you need to learn. And you shouldn't be kind of like frozen by the first decision that comes up. Cause you have to make a lot of decisions along the way. You need to get like good at just kind of making decisions. And you also need to learn, I always say this and it sounds silly, but you have to learn how to learn because learning is a skill and it's the most important skill that you can possibly learn. Because once you learn how to learn, you're kind of unstoppable, right? You can just pick things up as you go and you're not so kind of intimidated by whatever unknowns there are. So if you, you know, have an idea, <laughs> it's not whiskey, it's uh, tea. <laughs> I wish, oh, I'm glad it's not whiskey, but that'd be quite a lot of whiskey for a little bit of half. Uh, um yeah you just have to learn how to learn and, and once you do that you're you really are unstoppable because then you can just pick things up as you go there's a there's kind of a balance between planning ahead and being overburdened by all the work that's ahead of you because games are a ton of work there's no denying that but if you just like put one foot forward and you get going and you kind of like start rolling that snowball it will build momentum and and, and 
that can kind of help you carry through as long as you know how to learn and you can kind of like figure out any roadblocks that you come across. I think that's really the most important thing. In terms of how to learn how to learn, I don't really have a great answer for that. Um, but I think that's that's kind of, you know, everyone's got their own personal learning style, whether that's just like watching YouTube videos or signing up for some like learning platform or doing more traditional like academic uh, schooling. Uh, but you need to figure out what works for you and you just need to learn how to learn. And that'll help you a ton in game development. It'll also help you a ton in life, uh, honestly, I think. Um, so yeah, that's my, my life advice for you. But yeah, learn how to learn. That's where I am right now <laughs> in this field. Uh, no game engine's gonna make your game fun or make it interesting or make it, you know what I mean? Unless you're the first game to use like Nanite or something and you're like big tech demo. That's maybe one thing, but that's not really a reliable thing to, to go for. At the end of the day, the engine can't make the game for you and it can't make the game interesting for you so it's really not what you should be spending all your time thinking about and now another very popular topic ai how do you see ai influencing the future of game development especially in the indie scene have you considered using ai driven tools or systems in your projects um have i considered using it no uh and the reason is i just i don't want to take the artistry out of it i think mm -hmm. you know there's there's a lot of um very hot debates on this I definitely fall on the side of, I would say, being like anti-AI. I'm not like the most vocal person about it, but personally, I just wouldn't use it. Even if you have the best AI model, the best uh, LLM in the world, and you create beautiful, stunning artwork with it and, and all this kind of stuff, I just, to me, that's not enjoyable. You're not, I don't, I don't feel like I'm creating it. I feel like I'm just like taking pictures off Google images or something like that. You know what I mean? Not to mention all the ethical side of like how the model is trained, where all the training data and all that kind of stuff. I used to actually work in machine learning um, as part of my career for, for many years. So I know how these things work. I know how, you know, neural networks and, and all that kind of stuff work. I'm not an expert on it, but I, I know the basics. And it, it's not like magic. It's just code and, and algorithms and stuff like that. So I'm not like overly afraid of where things are going. I don't think it's going to like replace everyone's jobs or anything like I don't think all the doom and gloom scenarios are quite warranted just yet. But I also just don't love the direction that that's going. Um, I think it's taking the artistry away. I think, you know, again, this isn't the most original take, but like, why are we automating interesting things like art mm -hmm. and not automating like doing the laundry? Like, where's the where's the uh, the AI to come do my laundry for me? You know what I mean? Like, get rid of automate those tasks. Why are we why are we automating the fun stuff, the interesting things? And then as a player, like, I just don't want to play a game that was made in large part by AI. It's just doesn't interest me. I want to know, I want to connect with the, the creator of the game. I want to know what their intent was. I want to understand like where their heart was in, in all these decisions that they were making. Um, and I think that kind of gets lost when you introduce AI to it. So that's my take on that. In terms of where things are going, I do think it's kind of inevitable, unfortunately. I know that's really defeatist, but I don't think that there's any getting away from it. Like the kind of cats out of the bag. And unless there's like extremely stringent regulations on the use of AI, it is going to proliferate and is going to grow and grow and grow and it's probably at some point in time whether that's you know five years from now or 50 years from now there's going to be some point where it's kind of like inevitable that the vast majority of games or media is going to be using it i think that sucks but hopefully it'll just be like some like small niche like artisan kind of games or something like that for people who are are not using it but that's just my opinion yeah i also respect that a lot the thing is it really helps me in terms of coding because i don't really have enough experience with that. Now I'm trying to make things by myself more, but of course it takes a lot of time. But yeah, the feature is a bit scary. I mean, I saw videos when you just type in text, like prompt, you give it to AI and it just creates automatically the entire scene. I, I'm definitely speaking from a position of privilege in a sense that like, I've already got 10, 15 years under my belt working as a software engineer. Mm -hmm. If I was coming out of school right now, I'd probably have a very different opinion um, because it is a leg up and why wouldn't you take that? Ironically, like as a software engineer, I'm less concerned about people using AI for coding. Mm -hmm. It's more of the art side of things that I just think is unfortunate. Um, I still think the ethical issue is there regardless. Like, you know, I know that some, like I used to write kind of old technical blog posts and I know some of those are in some of these LLM training sets and that kind of sucks, but I'm also not really too worried about it because we're all using Stack Overflow anyways. There's not really any difference. I think, yeah, it's more the art side. I just think is kind of, unfortunate because it's kind of leading to like there's already a proliferation of like lower quality games i would say and that's completely fine because those games all have a right to exist but then when you add ai on top of that it just becomes a bit more like blop just kind of like being churned out and content for the sake of content um that's that's more where to me i think it's really unfortunate um 
but it's, it's a really complicated topic for sure like it's it's not something that's like exactly easy to be binary about is what it is i think like i said i think the cat's out of the bag and i don't think it's going back in um so i think it's probably something we all have to learn to live with whether we like it or not and i think that's kind of unfortunate personally but it is what it is so i know i said previously that even though the questions are somehow close to each other the answers are always different but in terms of ai also freya and Google game devs are concerned about the art side of things you need to have that's why i say like you should kind of learn as you go and, and, and figure things out as you go because you have like a clear vision of like whatever game it is that you're trying to make. If you just sit there and you're like, I need to learn all of these things before I start, that's going to be overwhelming. And if you don't have a game idea or you don't have like some objective, you're just like wandering the void and you're like, there's there's just so many things you could learn. How do you know which things are actually important? So yeah, having a goal is very, very helpful in that and like structuring your learning. Um, so 100% agree with Jason there. So with Jason, are you talking about like communication between kind of team members or is it like communication with the final user like for example like if you're not say you're an engineer and you're not a strong like 2d artist using ai to kind of fill that gap in order to communicate your vision to the players is that what you mean because personally i would still prefer to see you know i hate to say this but like lesser art or, or kind of rougher art or whatever it is that's actually handmade rather than ai generated i just to me, like it, it, there's more personality and more kind of shines through in that sense. Uh, when you when you use AI, there's like this kind of sameness about them. And then again, the whole ethical quandary is, is the whole other part of that. But just in terms of the end product, I still think that AI has a little bit of sameness about it. But that said, like I mean, assets are totally cool. I'm I'm not opposed to using assets. So yeah, I don't know. It's it's really complicated. Like I said. Yeah, what I was thinking about is also the fact that um, I'm. Besides very interested in the game, also very interested about the person behind the game. And just the thought that there's no one actually behind it, it's weird and hard to practice. Yeah. yeah like, I, like when I'm playing a game, it's almost like a, a conversation between you and the game's designer, right? And, and everything has intent and every little like light and every little whatever it is has a meaning and has a purpose and if there's a reason that it's there i just think that's lost and it's really a shame oh, so, oh, so he's talking more about yeah. like a, a consultant that's interesting i hadn't really thought about using ai in that sense that's okay. interesting i think i think you're still left with the ethical issues of where the training data came from um i don't i don't think that there's any like oh well this isn't actually going the final product so it's not unethical i still think it's unethical no matter what if if people's art was used to train the model without their consent full stop in my opinion it's unethical to use that if you put that aside and you assume that there's a model that was created all ethically or whatever that is an interesting use case uh, of using ai as this kind of starting point i think that's that could be interesting for sure another question yeah. that just popped into my head is that when you want to launch your first game do you think it's better to start to start with steam and then uh, try to publish it on magazine play after dawn or focusing more on the android part and then switching to uh, windows you're saying focusing on mobile versus windows mm -hmm. kind of yeah i think they're really different markets so i think if you're if you're looking at it from the point of view of like a business i think they're very very different markets you kind of need to understand the strengths and, and negatives of both how you get reach how you monetize and it's almost like two entirely separate products like taking the same game from windows and putting it on mobile or vice versa you kind of have to like Again, if you're if you're looking at this as a business, you kind of have to tailor them to the different markets so they're kind of different. Um, in terms of just like learning experience, I think mobile is a perfectly great way to do it because you can find a lot more people who have a phone capable of playing your game probably than a computer, especially if you're younger and, and you're in school. Like everyone has a smartphone, but not everyone has like a gaming rig or something like that. Um, so I think it's a great way. It's a great way to kind of like go around. You can show people on your phone anytime and get a lot of feedback really quickly. Um, and it's just like really kind of, you know, rewarding to have like your game in your pocket all the time. I think that's really cool. I've never like, at least not in like the last 10 years, uh, really like seriously looked at mobile as a market. So I don't really know too much about it. Um, I don't really like play games on my phone anymore. I used to a lot when I was younger, but nowadays I don't really as much. Um, See, so yeah, I don't know too much about it, but I think in terms of development, yeah, it can definitely be a, a good starting point. Do you have any favorite uh, mobile games or even computer games? Let me see what I have on my phone because I haven't played I haven't played games on my phone in like years. I don't even know if I have chess. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really have I don't really play games on my phone anymore. Uh, in terms of computer games, yeah, I mean I love like I said I love like Walking Sims, like finishing of Ethan Carter, 
uh, What Remains of Edith Finch, Journey, a lot of that kind of kind of like emotional, heavier uh, walking sim kind of games. Um, one of my favorite games is Hellblade, the, the first Hellblade. I just absolutely mm -hmm. adore that game. I think it's really brilliant. Um, I took a lot of inspiration from that, and um, I, I just absolutely love that game. I'm a huge baby with horror. Like, I cannot watch horror movies, I cannot play horror games. I played The Last of Us and I barely got through it. Like, it was an absolute nightmare to me. But for some reason, over like the last month, I've been forcing myself to just get over it and play horror games. So I just played Dead Space, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I'm playing Resident Evil 3, which is my first Resident mm -hmm. Evil game ever um so i'm trying to get into like horror games because i love horror aesthetic but i just cannot handle jump scares and stuff so i'm trying to like grow up a little bit and and, and deal with that but yeah i would say like darker moodier emotional games is kind of always my my forte or my my preference mm -hmm. interesting are there any upcoming indie games or developers whose work excites or inspire you yeah for sure um alex canar canaris saturio Anyways, the developer of a game called Mythrect, he made a game called Roki, uh, and now he's working on a game called Mythrect. Um, it looks brilliant, he's a, he's a really great guy, uh, we've met a couple times, and uh, just just a brilliant guy. And uh, I'm really looking forward to playing that. Uh, Kevin Anderson, he's the developer of a game called Paper Clay, looks like a lot of fun, it's like a 3D platformer kind of collect-a-thon, uh, but it's just got a ton of personality and plays like this little chicken, and it looks like an absolute blast. And there's like games on I see on Twitter like every day that I'm just like, you know, blown away by it, just really inspired by it, and, and really look forward to playing them. This game called The Milk Lake, which just looks really, really interesting. Uh, I don't know the developer of that, but uh, it looks great. Oh, some some humble onion. His game already came out. Smushy Come Home. He was uh, he worked with the same publisher as I did. But Smushy Come Home is just you know it's got the most personality of any any game I've ever played. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's super cute and charming, um, and I would I would recommend anyone to play that. I just I don't think you could possibly play that and not be you know, come away feeling like just absolutely giddy and happy. Wow, okay. Another thing to try in the North. Now, looking beyond Federal North, do you have any plans or ideas for future projects? Uh, I have started um, prototyping a few things, but like I said, I'm trying to take my time and just make sure I'm kind of like ready to start the next project. So I don't really have anything I can share yet, but it, it's kind of like going back to a conversation of like narrative versus gameplay. That's really my big conundrum right now. I have a couple ideas that I think are strong, all, all I think could potentially be, you know, viable projects, but it's do I go down the narrative route again, uh, or do I go more of a gamey kind of game? And just before this call, I was kind of prototyping something that's a little bit of a marriage of the two, that I think could be interesting, um, kind of like in a slightly survival horror kind of genre. Um, not full-blown horror, but like dark and, and moody and stuff, um, with some kind of more action-y gameplay, but still having a very heavy story. Um, and I think that could potentially be good, but then it's back to scope and whether that's too big of a project. Uh, so I'm trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. For me, it's like I see a game and I suddenly get very interested about the creator as well. And then I just follow like the learning curve and all the games and projects they are working on. And it's very interesting to see, you know, if they also switch their, their preferences over time and try to approach gameplay more than the narrative or, you know. One more comment, Jason says. A super game dev recommendation is one called The Magic Circle. It's like a game about game development. Fun. Wow, okay. Very interesting. Oh, I'm looking at the Steam page now. This actually looks really, really funny. The, the tagline is, uh, can you release a game from the inside? It's interesting. Like you're like inside a game, making a game. It looks like it's cool. This was my question. And I'm very, very happy that we did it. So thank you so much for sharing your journey. Thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure learning more about your creative process and I'm excited to experience more of your work in the future. Jason said, no question, but love the video. Looking forward to picking up the game. Make sure to do so. You have the link in the description. Download it, buy it, play it right now. <laughs> Please. I will also do that. I promise I'm going to do live streams with it. I will. I will see when. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. It's no worries. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here. And I'm looking forward to your next project. Bye. See ya. Bye. <laughs>